Amen. So Genesis chapter 11, we're going to focus on the beginning part. Of course, we see the introduction of Abram in Genesis chapter 11, but we're going to focus on the beginning of the chapter. So this morning, I want to give you some thoughts on science this morning. Just a couple of thoughts. I want to give you some, um, some, just some things to think about when you think about, when you see all these different advancements that we read about in the news, you know, technological advancements, medical advancements, whatever it may be. I want to give you a couple biblical thoughts this morning on how we are to view these things and how God actually views a lot of these things that we're seeing today. Just give you some biblical perspective on things that you're going to see going forward and that you've probably already seen um, throughout most of your life. So look down there at Genesis chapter 11. Let me just give you some thoughts on modern day science and technology this morning. Look at Genesis chapter 11 and verse number 1. And let's just look at this story of what happens here of this society that was happening or that was being formed at this time and what they were doing. Look at verse number 1 of Genesis chapter 11. The Bible says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. So you wonder, you know, where did all these different languages come from? Where did all these different nations come from? You know, this is the story in the Bible that explains all of that. And it came out of something that wasn't a good thing. It was something that God did, um, you know, to, to fix a problem. Look at verse number two. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. So what is, what is happening here in this story? Basically what you have happening here is what you'll see happening, you know, even in modern times. You have, in verse number three, you have a building material advancement here. You have a technological discovery here. You know, the one thing, you know, this actually, this one particular thing, actually, it holds up you know, a lot of progress even today. You know, building, building materials, the availability of certain materials. These people found, you know, out how to make bricks or how to make cement and mortar and these types of things to build a tower. We'll see that they start building it um, with. And look, we have the same exact problem today, building things. Okay, we have, look, we have models, we have simulations, we have calculations where we could make all of these, these machines that generate our power, we could make them way more efficient than they are today. Why don't we do it? Because we simply don't have the materials that can stand up to the pressures and the temperatures that this machine would call for, this machine that would be more efficient would produce. Okay, we could make your car way more efficient than it is today, and you could get much better gas mileage than you do today, but the problem is, is a material problem. So these machines, these, these next generation machines, they remain theoretical. They remain not be able to build because we haven't built the materials yet. We haven't found a way to make materials, metals that are strong enough to contain, you know, the pressures and temperatures that these machines would produce. It's very simple. So, but these folks in Genesis chapter 11, they had a breakthrough here. They had a breakthrough. They found out how to make bricks. They found out how to make cement and mortar. And look at verse number four. This is what they did with it. They had a breakthrough where they could now advance their civilization, and this is what they did with it. And they said, go to. Let us build a city and a tower. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. Let's go build a, a city with this new technology, these new materials. And then look what the Bible says whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So there we see, therein lies the problem in verse number 4 with these people. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language. And this, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And then in verse number 7, the Bible says, Go to, let us go down, and therefore confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So here's the Trinity in the Bible, first of all. This is very similar to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, where you know, God says, Let us make man in our own image. He's talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's speaking in plural about God, okay, about the Trinity. 
That's just a side note. Look at verse number 8. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to, to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. So God, you know, all of a sudden makes them all speak different languages. This is where all of our different languages came in the world. The Bible is explaining it to us here. And that, ends the, that puts an end to their technological advancement right there. I mean, imagine, you know, if you had a bunch of people working together on a project, and all of a sudden, every single one of them spoke a different language, and they couldn't understand what they were saying. You know, the project would end very quickly. And that's what happened here. So, as we look at this story, what was the problem? You know, the, the material advancement, you know, the engineering advancement was not the problem. The problem is they were trying to reach heaven. They were trying to reach God. They got prideful. They got lifted up. And, you know, God destroyed their society for it. Okay? So, I mean, you know, there's some thoughts here. Look at um, verse number 11. As we go into the genealogies, you know, just a side thought as well. You know, on verse number 11, the Bible says, And Shem lived after he begot um, Arphaxad 500 years and begot sons and daughters. Look, men were also living so long that, you know, they were figuring things out. I mean, I tell you what, if you give me 800 years... I'm going to be an expert on a lot of stuff, okay? If you give me 800 years and you give me sons, you know, if I have, if I have sons and daughters when I'm 200 years old, 300 years old, and I can, I can just relay all that information from generation to generation, and then I live another 600 years, boy, I'm going to, I'm going to figure some things out in this world, okay? God also, you know, God also started limiting lifespans of men. You know, that's another, and I believe that this is one of the reasons why he's managing the situation on earth after the flood. He limits, you know, the, you know he starts to limit man's, man's age. And around the Exodus period, you know, you got men living 70, 80 years. You know, Moses and um, Joshua were some of the, you know, the last men that lived to be 120 years old. So we see that, you know, God starts limiting men's age at that point as well. So look. There was, now, but here's what's interesting. So you say, what is the point of all this? How does this, you know, apply to us? What's interesting is this, okay? In the last 200 years or so, in our society, in our country, in really in our world, especially in our country, especially the last 100 years, we see a steady exponential ramp of learning and information that's available. Okay, it seems, it seems that God is allowing it again. Turn to Daniel chapter 12. So I want to explore this morning, you know, what are the limits of these things? What does God think about these things? And why is God limiting, um, or why is God allowing this steady information, this exponential ramp of knowledge that's happening today? Well, look at Daniel chapter 12, and I believe the Bible tells us right here. Look at Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 4. So we had in Genesis chapter 11, once again, we had man advancing technologically. They got prideful. They tried to reach heaven. They tried to reach God, and God shut them down for it. But today, in the last, you know, in the last couple of hundred years, we've had a lot of advancements as compared to you know, the rest of the history of mankind. Look at Daniel chapter 12, verse number 4. The Bible tells us that this, that this will happen. Look what the Bible says. But thou, O Daniel... Shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, and the Bible says, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Well, look, the world has never seen anything like the last hundred years. The world has never seen, you know, advancements in the industrial age, advancements in technology, machines, and just knowledge in general. It, the availability of knowledge in our world today has never been as it is right now. There has never been more knowledge available freely to the common man in our world than there is right now. That's quite a statement. That's quite a statement to say that all this knowledge is available to us. So while the world has never seen anything like this, you know, what does it mean? What does God think about it? Why is it happening? Well, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 12, in verse number four, that it's a sign of the end times. Okay? Now look, I'm not going to start predicting the end of the world here. Don't, don't get nervous on me, okay? But I'm, I'm saying we ought to notice these things. We ought to notice 
these things. We've got an enormous amount of information available to us. Look, I'm, I'm, working, on a, I'm working on an engine at home. And, you know, I don't know the things that I'm, I'm working on, but it's incredibly easy to find out all the different things. I'm working on a, a 1983 short block Chevy is what I'm working on. And I don't know my way in and out of this, this motor, but it's very easy to learn by just finding some video on the Internet of somebody that's, that's already done it. I mean, look, it's quite a machine. You say it's built in 1983. Look, it's quite a machine. It's quite a piece of technology. It's like a finely tuned clock. Everything works perfectly in tune, but it's fairly easy to learn because all the knowledge is available. It's just, it's right there. There's videos on everything, from the fuel system to the timing to the whole thing. It's all available. Anybody can learn it. Anybody can learn it. So here we have all of this information available. Now turn, it, turn to Romans chapter 1. I mean, this is just one small example. All this information on all these different machines and all this different technology, it's all available to anybody that can hear the words coming out of my mouth. But here's the irony of what's happening today. While all that knowledge is available, all that knowledge is available, look, it is a sign, you actually you don't have to turn to Romans chapter 1, but basically it's a sign that it's not a really a blessing. It's society, our society as a collective we have never been dumber than we are today. So why is that? All of this knowledge that's so freely available, it, it's never been so available, but we as a society have never been dumber. With all the technology, just think about this for a minute. All the technology, all the smartphones, all the computers, all the gadgets, all the engines, all the drones. It would be difficult to find a teenager today that knew his way around a motor. It would be difficult to find that. I mean, even an adult. It would be hard to find an adult that knew his way around a motor that was 40 years old. It would be tough that the, the single guys just went on a, a hike uh, yesterday. I wanted to go so bad, but my wife said, you're not single and you're too old. I think I could have made it. But here's the thing. It would be difficult to find someone today that could use a compass. It would be difficult to find somebody today that you could give a map to and give a compass to and say, find your way out of the woods. Here's the map, here's the compass. You would, it would be hard-pressed to find somebody that could do that. Even, even, in, the, even in the areas of literacy, of, of, of reading, of writing, of education in general. Look, it doesn't take long reading a classic, you know, like a, just take a classic author like Charles Dickens, a secular author. I, you read a book by Charles Dickens, and you can understand why most people today would have a hard time understanding that kind of writing. I mean, they wouldn't be able to understand the language, they wouldn't be able to have the comprehension of all the different, I mean, he was so detailed in the way he described things, it was like you're there, the way he wrote things, but you'd be hard pressed to find somebody today that could understand that type of, that type of writing. Even the writings, you know, I think about even the writings of like the founders of the country. I think about you know, the Federalist Papers. I think about some of the things that these men wrote. And I think today, and when I read those things, I'm like, you know what? People today, not only would they not have the, the, the knowledge, the wisdom to understand the language that's being written down, but they wouldn't even be able to comprehend the thoughts that these men are talking about. So, the ideas that they were setting forth would, would be just hard to comprehend for most people today, even adults today. So look, as a whole, what I'm trying to get you to understand is there's a, there's a, real, there's a real dichotomy here. There's a real problem here where the most, there's the most knowledge available to us. There's all these great technologies and all these things, but as a society, we're, we're, we're dumb. You know, we're not, we're not that advanced as a society. We're not as bright as men used to be, is what I'm trying to get you to understand. So, for some reason, for some reason, God is allowing these advancements right now. As we advance, as knowledge increases, and as we depart from God, this is what the Bible says in Romans 1. It says, as we depart from God, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's what's happening here. 
Because as Genesis chapter 11, as the people in Babel building the tower trying to reach God, they professed themselves to be wise. They didn't say, you know what, our wisdom comes from God. Our wisdom comes from God. Everything that we have comes from God. They tried to become their own gods. And that's what's happening in our country. Yes, knowledge is increasing. Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 4 tells us that knowledge will increase in the time of the end. But we are becoming fools because we're professing ourselves to be wise. So that's the first thing. Look, that is, that is science of the last hundred years, folks. Science of the last hundred years is professing ourselves to be wise. And you can see that we're becoming fools because what science of the last hundred years is, it's, it's we're trying to, we're, we're, we're proclaiming ourselves as God. That's science of the last hundred years. You know, or at least that we don't need God. As we push scientific theories like, you know, the Big Bang Theory and evolution and all these different things, we're getting rid of God. We don't need Him. We can reach heaven ourselves, is what we're saying. And look, as this happens, He's, you know, we are becoming, He is causing us to become fools. That's why you see this happen. Look, it, it's poetic justice. It's poetic justice when you think about it that way. But look, these advancements will have their limits. And God will limit these advancements just like He did in Genesis chapter 11. And that's really you know, what I want to get at this morning. What those limits are, are defined in the Bible. Now this is what really... Um, let me give you the first limit that God will always keep and enforce. And the first limit is this, and this is kind of the inspiration for this sermon is when I read this article um, that I read this last week. And I've read many articles like this, but I'm just like, you know what, this deserves a sermon. This deserves some thoughts. And hopefully I'm not just confusing you all because a lot of these are just things that I think about according to the Bible. But here's the first thing. Here's the first rule that God will always enforce. God is the life giver. God is the life giver. Let me read you an article from Science Daily that I just read a few days ago. The Bible says, or not the Bible, Science Daily says this, Investigators in China and the United States have injected human stem cells into primate embryos and were able to grow chimeric embryos for a significant period of time, up to 20 days. The research despite its ethical concerns, has the potential to provide new insights into development, bi developmental biology and evolution. It also has implications for developing new models of human biology and disease. The work appears in the April 15th in the journal Cell. So a couple things. First of all, the press is usually misleading with clickbait type um, articles like this because when you actually read into the details of what first of all they said they created chimeras okay so a chimera is a, like a mythical creature it's a mythical mix of two animals so it's like a like a horse body with a lion head that's a chimera okay so what they're saying is that they produced a chimera here and what they actually did was they took uh, a monkey embryo okay a fertilized monkey embryo they injected human cells into it and it died they, they basically poisoned it with human cells okay but they're mixing human you know cells with animal cells okay and like despite its ethical concerns you know they brush that one off quickly Right? They're talking about creating superhumans and all this kind of stuff. Okay? But look, it, it's a misleading article. You know, I mean, they said, you know, it, it lived for a significant period of time, up to 20 days. Basically, when you read what actually happened, most of them died right away. One lived for like 19 days or something. But they basically killed this living thing, is what they did, by mixing human and animal cells together. Okay? So this wasn't a human monkey mix as they would try to make you think in the, in the uh, traditional, you know, in the article title. Okay, they're trying to get you to click on articles. Everything's trying to get you to click on articles, by the way. But it wasn't a human monkey, monkey mix as would be thought of in a traditional, you know, breeding situation. Okay, they simply poisoned a monkey, a monkey embryo with, you know, uh, human cells. So that would be uh, less exciting if they put it that way, though. But look, it's a celebrated article. Turn to Genesis chapter 1 and let's look at why they died. 
Okay, let's look at why this embryo died when they put um, the human cells into the monkey embryo. Why did it die? Turn to Genesis chapter 1 and look at verse 24. If people would just read the Bible, they would just understand how things work better. They would understand, you know, not only how things work and why they work, but what we should do and what we shouldn't do. Okay, look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 24. Why did it die? And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after its kind, after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and the beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. Everything will be able to bring forth after its own kind, folks. That is how God designed it. These are the rules, and they will always be the rules. Humans after humans, monkeys after monkeys, dogs after dogs. Look, that's why there's many different kinds of dogs. Look, there wasn't, there wasn't, you're like, there's like 10,000 different breeds of dogs out there. But they can all intermingle because they're the same kind. They're the same kind, a Labrador and a pit bull. They can breed together because they're the same kind. So there wasn't 10,000 dogs on the ark, there was two. There was two. And then, you know, they can be bred into different traits and things like this. You know, there's many different kinds of dogs, cattle after cattle, it's the same thing. Many different kinds of cattle. But you can't breed a cow with a dog. It won't work. You know, there's different kinds. So what are we doing here? Look, I mean, as a matter of fact, God actually controls this very closely. Because, if, I mean, there's certain cases where, like a horse and a donkey who are very similar, they can have offspring. And you, that's, what a, that's what a mule is. You ever heard of a mule? It's a, it's, a, it's a cross between a horse and a donkey. But guess what? A mule cannot reproduce. It's very similar to, in North Dakota, we have two types of deer. We have mule deer, and then we have white-tailed deer. Every now and then, you'll hear about, you know, they live in different, they live in different uh, terrains, they have different um, habits, and they eat different things, and they like different climates. So you won't usually find them together, but there's some certain places in North Dakota where you have white-tailed deer and mule deer. And you can get a cross every now and then. You'll hear about a cross between a white-tail and a mule deer. But guess what? That cross cannot produce its own offspring. GMO seeds, I could really get into conspiracy st stuff with you here on GMO seeds, but here's the thing with GMO seeds. So they take seeds, they take a natural thing that God has, you know, you know that wheat will bring forth wheat and it will produce seeds of wheat. You know what my grandpa used to do? He used to save 10% of his crop, he would farm and he would take 90% of his crop and sell it and then he would take 10% of the best part of his crop and use it for seed for the next year. Because it brought forth after its own kind. The seeds, you know, brought forth the seeds of the same plant. But guess what? So we can take these plants and we can, we can you know, take, put proteins in them and do all these different things to make them resistant to certain pesticides and herbicides. And we can make them produce more seeds. And we can make them, you know, now, my grandpa used to get about 30 bushels to the acre. Now, if you're not getting 60 to 80 bushels to, acre, to the acre, you're out of business because of the GMO seeds and the different ways of fertilizing. But here's what the GMO seeds, what you can't do. What you can't do with the GMO seed is keep 10% of it for next year because the GMO seed is not an heirloom seed. It can't reproduce. It can produce one time. So, you have to go back to the same company and buy more seeds the next year, and more seeds the next year. So to stay in business, you must use the GMO seeds, and you have to keep going back to the same company. This is where the conspiracy comes in, that basically one company controls the food supply of the entire world, but no big deal. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> but my point is, it, it, it goes to God laid out rules. And if you play with those rules, it's, it's not going to work. He's going to limit. There's limits of things that we can do. So, kind brings forth after kind. So what are we doing mixing kinds together, especially with human life? Turn to Leviticus chapter 20. Look, some things will just not be allowed. As a matter of fact, humans mixing with animals in a traditional breeding situation is actually punished by death in the Old Testament. 
I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an unnatural thing that we don't even like to think about, but God had to point it out. I mean, you think about the rules that God had to make, and you're just like, wow. He had to think of everything. But look at Leviticus chapter 20 and verse number 15. The Bible says, And if man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death. And you shall slay the beast. So this is what we know. My, the point I'm trying to make is this. We already know what God thinks of this. We already know what God thinks of this. And considering how God reacted to people pushing limits in the beginning in Genesis chapter 11, it's probably not going to be good. You know, we're just heading into, you know, turn to Genesis chapter 2. It's probably not going to be good. God is the life giver. God is the life giver. Look at Genesis 2 and verse 7. The Bible says, and I can read you verse after verse after verse. I'll just read you a couple. But the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Look, first of all, animals don't have living souls, by the way. You'll never see that in the Bible. Okay, so I hate to break it to you, kids, but all dogs don't go to heaven. All right? No dogs go to heaven. You're like, oh. That's why, you know, look, it's sad. Look, it's sad when a pet dies. We just had a pet die. Okay, look, it's sad. We missed the pet. But look, the pet, you know where the pet is? The pet's in the ground or the landfill or wherever they took it. You know, the pet is, is not, does not have a living soul. Okay, there goes half the church just as leaving. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but man, man is the only one that has a living soul, and he has that living soul because God breathed life into him. God specifically gave life. Look at Job chapter 20, or Je Job chapter 33. Job chapter 33. Animals don't have living souls. It only says this in the Bible about the man. Job chapter 33, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Look, God gives life to our bodies and our souls. Every person alive today, every single person that is alive today or that has ever lived has been given this life and this soul. So, I mean, this is what you can say to the guy that you're out soul winning that doesn't believe in God or doesn't like God or whatever and says, what has God ever done for me? Well, he gave you your life and your soul. He breathed it into you even though you don't you know, you're not going to respect him for that. You're not going to thank him for that. Look, God has given every single person who has ever lived the most precious thing that they will ever have, which is their life and their soul. And it's interesting because with all the advancement, now think about this, with all the advancement, with all the machines, with all the rockets, I love rockets, you know, with all the technology, the capabilities of just what we can do. I mean, I toured an oil rig one time. Just like you say, an oil rig. I mean, this oil rig I toured, this, this guy, the foreman on the oil rig said, they're drilling, they're drilling five miles into the ground. They're drilling, five. I'm like, how do you know there's oil down there? There's a spot like 10 feet wide, five miles away that they have to get into. And I'm like, they know because they have technology that tells them what's in the ground five miles away. I said, how do you know you can get there? He said, I can hit a coffee can five miles away with this drill bit. That's technology. That's impressive. I love stuff like that. But with all these capabilities, we can't create one living cell. We can't create one living cell. We can't create, you say, oh, the robots. The AI, the self-driving cars, get in one, you'll die. <laughs> okay? Don't get me started on self-driving cars. I used to build control systems for a living. There's a lot of problems there, okay? 99.8% is not good enough. You can't kill the driver 0.2% of the time. It's not going to work. But look, we can't create one living, all the, think of the robots. The robot dog, you ever seen that one? The military robot dog? We can't create a robot that has even one life cell in it. We can't create a robot that is as complicated as even a, a, a fruit fly. As even the smallest thing that we don't even think about. Oh, 
I just smashed like one of the you know, most complicated machines that man will never be able to build. Not one living cell. Look, but we can toy with life. Can't we? Isn't that what we're doing? Isn't that what we're doing? We're taking something that we can't, we can't create, one living cell, but we're toying with it. We can mess with it. We can poison it. We can clone it. Shoot electricity into it and shoot some more cells into it. We can do all these things. We can inject things into that life that God has already made. That was punishable by death, which I, I showed you. We can harvest things from life. We can take, you know, what God has created and we can, we can harvest things like stem cells from it. Which leads me to my next point. You know what we're really good at? You know what we're really good at? We can't create a single cell and, because God's the life giver. It's very clear. I could have read you a hundred verses in the Bible talking about how God is the life giver. You know what man's really good at, though? We're good at taking it away. We're good at taking away life. You know what we're really good at? We're good at murder. You know what we're really good at? We're good at abortion. That's what we're good at. We're good at wrecking it. We're good at destroying it. You know, we're good at war. We're good at wars that kill millions of people. We're really good at that. We're good at killing the most innocent life that God has ever created. And not only that, but we're good at killing that life and then extracting, you know, parts from that life and doing sick experiments on animals with that murdered life. That's what we're good at. No thanks. I'll stick to rockets. I mean, look. That it, you know what? Taking life is also God's domain. Giving life is God's domain, and taking life is God's domain. I'm telling you, God will end these advancements. Just like He stopped what was happening in Genesis chapter 11, God will not allow certain things. If man doesn't have enough respect to, to respect God's boundaries, like kind after kind. Look, God doesn't change. God, He will intervene, just like He did in Genesis chapter 11. But we push these limits. We push these limits. And you know what they did in Genesis chapter 11? They pushed the limits. They pushed God. They tempted. They tempted God. We ought not to tempt God. We ought not to test God. Hey! Who thinks it's a good idea to see how far we can push the Lord? Whenever you see man toying with this life that we can't create and messing with it, this is like in mixing beast with man in any way, this is, this is testing God. When you read articles like that, you say, you know what? We're testing God. Whenever you see man taking away life like it's nothing. Look at Manasseh. He sacrificed children. He sacrificed human beings. He was just taking away life. We're doing the same thing. Way worse today. We're testing God. But here's the thing. Here's why you have to care. Here's why you have to care right here today. You read an article like that and you say, you know what? I'm not for this. I'm not doing that. But you know what happened in Babel, in Genesis chapter 11? You know what happened with Manasseh? and the nation of Judah. You know what happened there? The entire nation paid the price. God didn't just go into Babel and say, you know what, you engineers making these bricks and you project managers that are trying to reach heaven. It's like, just you guys, I'm throwing you out. I'm throwing you out to uh, Mongolia. Get out of here. No, the entire, the, all of them paid. They all paid. Look, the entire nation will pay. He scattered everyone. And the entire nation of Judah paid for that flippant abuse of what God gives and what God does not allow just to be taken away. But here's another thought. So that's the first thing. If we don't watch it, if we tempt God, God will intervene. God will intervene and the entire nation, everybody will pay. So we should care. We should care what's happening. But here's another thing, just another thought for you. Turn to Psalm chapter 19. 
What about other advances? You say, okay, you know, all right, life, I get it, life, and taking away life, I get it. What about other advances? Are these okay? You know, what about just technology in general? Are these okay? Let me give you a couple more thoughts on this. How about, you know, technology, space? I mean, I love this stuff. Look at Psalm chapter 19. Look what the Bible says in Psalm chapter 19 and verse number 1. The Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Have you ever seen images from the Hubble Space Telescope? Now, we've got this telescope that orbits the Earth, and it's taking all these shots for the last, I don't know how many years, you know, decades. It's taking all these shots of distant galaxies, and, you know, the Bible says that that all those galaxies in the heavens, those heavens, you know, the, the, the heavens that we're looking at in space, the Bible says that that declares the glory of God. Is that what we're doing? We take the Hubble Space Telescope pictures and be like, can you believe, you think the, the, the engineers at NASA are like, look at the, the beautiful glory of God. You think that's what they're saying? You know what they're saying? You know what they're saying? They're like, I mean, what do we do with it? What do we do with all these images and all these, these beautiful galaxies that we found and these stars and all these things? They're like, man, are there any aliens out there? Yeah. Beep, 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 beep. You know, we're looking for aliens. This is what we're doing with it. We're looking for, soup, we're looking for, we're looking for the, the super civilization. <laughs> That's what these guys are doing. You know, guys that have been in school for 20 years with eight PhDs, they're looking for the super civilization and they're looking for Martians. Okay? I'm like, man, could, you, could we get Stephen Hawking to just design a better lawnmower? That would have been better for the world. Yeah. Instead, he's like imagining different universes that all happen at the same... This is what he believed. He believed that every different possible... I mean, I'm, no, this is real. Okay? Listen. This is what Stephen Hawking, one of the most, the, the most, and I believe that he had an IQ that was as high as they say it was. He had the capability. He had a machine upstairs that was capable of doing a lot of math, faster than probably any of us. But here's what he believed. He believed that every single possibility of any moment in time existed in its own universe. So like me walking up to Brother Adam and, and like, slapping him in the face like this a bunch of times, that, that actually exists in its own universe. Because it's possible that I could go do that right now. It's fine. It's not in this universe, brother. It's not right now. Okay? No, it is now, but it's in a different universe. It's a multiverse. Every possibility. Me running up and down screaming and, you know, running around and giving Matt a high five and then going to... I mean, there are infinite possibilities. They all exist in different universes. I mean, this is what he believed. Like I said, can we get you to uh, get a car? Make a car. Make a small block Chevy that gets 100 miles to the gallon, please. That's what we should have done with his time. Instead, we're looking for super civilizations. They're looking for aliens. And look, we're not going to find aliens, folks. Uh, look, I'm telling you, we're not going to find aliens. You're like, how do I know? You're like, how do you know that? How do you know that there's no aliens? Don't you know that people have been abducted by aliens? Look, folks, there's no aliens. Why? How do you know? Because, I mean, have you read the Bible? Have you read the Bible? Here's what the Bible's about. Let me, let me just, uh, let me give you the Bible in 20 seconds. The Bible, the Bible, the focus in the Bible is on us, on the earthlings. Okay? It's about our relationship, our relationship with God. That's what it's about. There's no third party. Okay? There's no third party. There's no Martians that come in. They're like, beep, 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 beep. Who's Jesus? Beep, 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 beep. Okay, it, look, it's not real. Okay? People do stuff to make money. People write books. I got abducted by aliens. Now I'm a millionaire because, you know, National Enquirer gave me $100,000 and I wrote a book. That's, that's what it is. So there, there. I mean, look, but here, let's go back to, you know, I digress. Look, the Bible, I mean, UF, you know what UFO means? There's UFOs. I believe in UFOs. You know what? Unidentified flying object. It means that something's flying around and they don't know what it is. UFO. That's, that's it. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. So what, I mean, what about all the, the galaxies? 
I mean, are you telling me that you know all these galaxies and all these other planets and all these stars, there's not like aliens living somewhere on one of those? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. How do you know? Because turn to Genesis chapter 1. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Because all that stuff, all that stuff, I mean, I don't want to give it away. I'm not going to give it away. Go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. I'm going to tell you what all of that is about. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. Look what the Bible says. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, the moon. And he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over day and night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So look, we have the reasons right here. So the heavens and the stars and the galaxies and everything in the firmament. What is the purpose? Number one, it's light. Number one, it's light. And interestingly enough, as we've already talked, light, it gives life. Did you know that if we didn't have the sun, which lights up the moon, by the way, that if we didn't have the sun, that everything would die. That all the plants, you ever heard of photosynthesis? All the plants that need the sunlight would die. All the animals that eat the plants would die. And eventually, we would die. If there was no light, we would freeze to death much sooner if there was no light. But look, interestingly, everything would die without the sun. Everything. Even us. So it's, it's light. It's light. That's the first thing. No, number two is seasons. And for seasons, verse number 14. I mean, the sun, the moon, the tides, the weather. Think about this. We still can't predict weather past 10 days. And even the 10 day forecast is, is you know, eh, past 10 days. Yet we're confident enough to say that we know what's going to happen in 20 years or 30 years. Every single prediction in the past, it's almost like God is confounding us. Every single prediction of global warming, global cooling, whatever, has been wrong. Has been wrong. We can't predict the weather past 10 days, but that's what the, all this stuff is for. The sun, the moon, the stars, it's all for the seasons. I mean, it's actually pretty um, amazing when you look at it, how stable the seasons and how stable the climate of our planet actually is, when you think about it. How about, how about days and nights, and for days? I mean, days and nights, you sleep much? I mean, there's times in Alaska where the sun just shines like 23 hours a day. That would be terrible. It's, it's for days and nights. And finally, it's to show the glory of God. It's to show the glory of God. Look, these things are put there. Th think, of our, think of our universe like, you know, a small block Chevy on steroids. It's this huge clock. It's this huge clock where everything's moving and rotating perfectly in time with one another to give us the seasons that we need, to give us the day and the night, to give us the tides, to give us the, the rain and the wind and the clouds and all these different things. This is the clock that God has designed. And we ought to be able to look at that and just say, man, look at the glory of God. We cannot predict it. We cannot control it. I mean, just look at the glory of God. That's what it's for. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Go there this time. So that's what the heavens are for. That's what the stars are for. There's, it's, it's not, there's no aliens. What about technological limits? How, how, much will God, how much will God allow us to invent in this world? And I want to ask you this question, and this is something I think about a lot. But look at Romans chapter 1. Let me ask you this question. Are we really inventing anything in this world? Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. The Bible says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. 
even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, the context of this is, is that we should be able to look at creation, we should be able to look at everything that God made, and we have no excuse for not recognizing God. None. Nobody has that, because everybody can see this. But what's interesting is the first part of this verse says some things that are really interesting. Because being looked at more specifically, we see that the invisible things of creation are understood by the things that are made. So when we make things, when we invent things, look, these are things, these are things that are here already. When we see the things of creation, the trees, the plants, the materials, they can be used to understand the invisible things. Okay? Now follow me here. Follow me here. Because this is, we don't really invent anything. And follow my thought process here. These, these things that are here already, the creation, the trees, the plants, the materials, the iron ore in the ground, they can be used to understand the invisible things. And when we do use those things to understand the invisible things, that's what we would call invention today. But look, let me give you an example. We find a rock. We find a rock. And this rock, for some mystical reason, it attracts other rocks. I'm speaking of a magnet. We find a magnet in the ground and it attracts certain rocks that have iron in it. And then we find that when you move this rock across other types of rock, that it induces an electrical charge into that other rock. So here we have, we're just, we're just playing around with rocks here. And we just found, look, we found some of these invisible things. Electricity is one of these invisible things. Look, electricity was always there. The rock was always there. They are the things that were made. We just figured out how to use them together. We just became understanding of that thing that God had already made. We just gained understanding through that. We didn't invent it. It was there. We were just, I mean, there was just a first person. Any invention could you follow this same thing. Look, I have two patents. I have two patents. I'm not telling you that because of how great I am. I have two patents where I've just, I've figured out, how, you know, I figured out something that was already there, and you put this over here and put this over there, and, you know, it became a new idea. And you know where the idea to even put those two rocks together in my case came from? That came from God. I have no idea how I got that idea. It came from God. And, but it wasn't anything new. It was already there. It was just understanding of the things that were made, that was given. Something invisible that was already there. There was just the first person to discover all these things. But they're the invisible things of God, and God had created them. They were already there. Electricity, silicon, the silicon transistor, probably one of the, the best inventions of the last hundred years. I mean, silicon was already there. It already existed. We just put things together to unlock these invisible things. So what I'm talking about is, well, how much is God going to allow? How much is God going to allow? Why didn't, I mean, why didn't Adam, you think about this, why didn't Adam, God, look, these things happen, these advances happen because God allows it, is what I'm trying to get you to understand. These things are already there. I don't know how many things, how many invisible things are still there. There's probably a lot. A lot of invisible things that are still there that we haven't unlocked. God just allows them to be unlocked. You say, why didn't Adam, if he lived 800 years, why didn't Adam unlock a lot of these things? Well, first of all, there's a lot of evidence that pre-flood civilizations had a lot of technology. There's a lot of evidence for that. But you know what? That doesn't fit, and I'm talking about batteries, electricity, you know, plumbing, even, you know, some people even say that they might have, there might be airplanes, there might have been, you know, flight pre-flood. There's evidence for that stuff. There's drawings for that thing. There's things that have been found. There's evidence for it. And I don't know how much there was and there wasn't, but the point is this. The point is this. It's because God allowed it. That's it. God will choose what he unlocks and what he doesn't and when he does so. And I believe, I believe that one of the main reasons that I think that our current society, and this is my opinion now, that I think that our current society and the advances that we are now having are part of, or a sign, at least a sign of the end times, is because they are certainly no longer a blessing on our society. So God is either blessing a society, which I believe was the case at the beginning of our, our country. 
You know, many of the men in the, in the 1700s and the 1800s, many of those scientists, they were actually engineers, who were experimenting and inventing things, motors, engines, all these different things, you know, processes to make more materials and different materials. Many of these men, I mean, I'm not saying they're all saved, but they at least acknowledged God. They at least acknowledged God. And, and, and some of them were saved, I believe. But that's different. That's a blessing on a society. That's a blessing on a society that knows that they're just unlocking the invisible things of God. That's not us today. So it must be. It must be a sign of the end times, in my opinion. But look, instead, you know, instead today, these advancements, they are, they're about us elevating ourselves. Even in the case of the biology experiment that I, I talked about that inspired this sermon, it's about us becoming superhuman. They even said it in the article. It's about advancing humankind over what it is. Hey, how about just, you know, be happy with the, the perfect thing that God made and quit trying to mess it up? It becomes more about man elevating himself, more about evolution, more about theories to get rid of God. This is the advancements that we see today and the reasons for them. And these, adva look, these advancements today are not factories and machines to better mankind. It, it, it seems like a lot of it is technology to drive us further into sin. There's a lot of good things about the internet, but there's a lot of bad things about the internet too. And I think man, I think because of the knowledge, look, there's this great increase of knowledge called the internet, where anything is available to us. And I think man is generally using it to become a worse man. That's what I think. It's great to be able to fix a motor yourself at home but it's worse to fall into sin. It's worse to get into sin so deep that maybe you don't even care about God anymore. To scar your own conscience to the point where if somebody came and preached the gospel to you, you wouldn't even want to hear it. Sin can do that to you. Sin can put you in such a scarred conscience situation where you could care less about God or knowing about it or even turn against Him. This is technology today. This is technology. Professing ourselves to be wise, we become fools. It's one of the biggest signs I see of end times. And if it's not end times, then it's just God removing his blessing from our countries. But look, two, two points to interesting times ahead. Interesting times ahead. Two points to summarize my random you know, thought process this morning. It, let me just summarize the two points. If we were smart, if we were smart, we would respect the rules and limits God has placed on life. God is the life giver and God is the life taker. And he has specific rules on ending it, on toying with it, on mixing it up. And we ought to respect that or we're testing God and it will never, I mean, people that tested God in the Bible, it never works out well for them. And God does not change. He feels the same way about this stuff that he did from the beginning of time. And the second thing is this. God decides, the second point is this, God decides, just to summarize, what he will unlock of the invisible things and what he will not. God decides that. And he will always decide that. It's really, you know, it's really too bad. It's really too bad that we're not a society that is glorifying God. Because what a great thing that would be if we were a society that was glorifying God, because I believe God would just keep unlocking those good things for such a society. A society that, that praised God as Daniel did, and every wonderful miracle that Daniel you know, did or prophesied, he said, glory to God, I did nothing. I did nothing, it came from God. And God just kept elevating and elevating and elevating. And look, we could be that Daniel society, but that's not us. That's not us, and it's going to come to an end because we're testing God in a lot of these different areas. And even the technology that we're inventing today and that we're using today with all this knowledge, as Daniel talks about in Daniel chapter 12, it, it's, being, it's, it's being used to destroy us. We're destroying ourselves with it. it. It's not God's blessing. You can clearly see that. But we should use it for that at least. But it's not God's blessing on our nation. We are testing God with this stuff. It's, it's a shame. You know, the heavens declare the glory of God. All these things, all these advancements, all these invisible things, they're not from us. 
It's the glory of God. It's the glory of creation, as Romans 1 says. All these, every single invisible thing that is invented or come up with, it's just, it's just unlocking the invisible thing of God. But we don't give God that glory. We take it for ourselves and we try to, we try to reach the heavens ourselves. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to end the same way that it ended for all these societies here. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.